The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough, filled with snow, and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there is one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan, a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu, located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, 
it had caused irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world, it also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the U.S. President, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, D.C. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircraft flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision, but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other, so the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Turbulence is caused by sudden shifts in the airflow and is nothing to be afraid of. But if that simple knowledge doesn't help you, try this visualization from a pilot. Put a small piece of napkin inside a pot of jelly. The napkin is the plane, and it's surrounded by jelly, or sorry, by air pressure. If you tap the jelly, the napkin will not fall anywhere. It just starts slightly moving within the jelly. Once the plane gets to its cruising altitude, it seems like the engine noise disappears altogether. No worries there, the engine is still working fine. It becomes way quieter than on takeoff because there's less thrust generated at this point. The air gets thinner and the plane needs less power to maintain its altitude. If the pilots leave the engines at their climb setting, you'd be traveling beyond the speed of sound, and that isn't a part of the plan. That small hole you see on the back of airplane tails is part of the auxiliary power unit. It's there to produce power for an airplane's electrical systems, including lights, navigation controls, heating, and AC. 
The power unit is activated when a plane is on the runway. It doesn't provide complete power to airplanes. Once the airplane engines are turned on, the unit is disabled. It's only reactivated when the airplane lands at its destination. The turbines are located under the wings since this makes it cheaper, faster, and easier to service the engines. They used to be placed in the tail, but it required expensive equipment and much more time to repair. When they started installing the engines below the wings, ticket prices went down. When seated in the exit row on most planes, you need to pull the window blind up, not down, to close it, unlike in all other seats. It's designed so for safety reasons. The overwing exit is there to help people quickly leave the plane in case of an emergency. Some of those exit window doors stay attached to the plane, others come away from the fuselage, but they all have an emergency handle at the top of the panel. You wouldn't be able to open the exit without it. There's another handle on the outside of the plane. Rescuers use it to open the door from their side. Because of this handle, there's no room for the blind to retract above the window. But there's more than enough room for it below the window. Makes sense to me now. You can actually raise the right armrest when in the aisle seat. The lock is on the underside of the armrest. It's not a button, but a lever close to the back of the seat. You can pull it to let the other passengers pass to their seats. The same tip works for the left armrest of the window seat. You can lift it up to lean on the window. Don't forget to lower the armrest during takeoff and landing for safety reasons. Planes usually use a small, powerful tug on airport grounds when they need to pull back out of their parking spot. But it doesn't mean they can't move backwards on their own. To do so, they need to use reverse thrust, and the powerful air current from it can pull some debris into the engine or cause damage to ground vehicles, the gate, or the ground crew. It would also use a lot of fuel and be incredibly loud. Plus, the pilots don't have rearview mirrors like drivers, so they can't see behind them. Now you understand why this risky process is banned at airports. They make plane wings smooth to let air flow easily around their surface and reduce resistance during the flight. Those convex, yellow hooks though, don't they worsen the aerodynamics? True, but they are necessary for your safety. Imagine a plane making an emergency landing in the open sea. The aircraft is sliding on the water. Then, rescue boats arrive to evacuate the passengers. Before the door opens, the escape slide inflates. Passengers need to walk on the wing and move down the slide, but the wing surface is slippery because of water. To prevent anyone from falling, the stewards install a rescue rope. They attach one end to the door and the other to the edge of the wing, passing it through these hooks. During the evacuation, people hold on to this cable like a railing. They can also attach rescue boats to the wing with a rope and these hooks, so the sea won't take people far away from the plane. When flight attendants pass through the cabin during the flight, they always touch the upper shelves above the seats. No, they don't check if the luggage compartments are closed. There are hidden handles along the bottom of these compartments. Flight attendants hold on to them not to fall. It's a pretty convenient thing since they don't have to touch the seats and disturb passengers once they're moving around the cabin. Have you ever noticed the flashing light in the cabin before takeoff? It's 100% safe. It occurs when the pilot disconnects a plane from the airport power supply and switches to the onboard one. This rapid transition may cause flashing. Passengers always board from the left side. That's because the captain sits on that side of the cabin. It's easier for him to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge this way. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with baggage on the right side. With passengers boarding from the left side, the crew can do their job undisturbed. You might have noticed black triangles on the wall above the seats. For you, as a passenger, they may indicate the seats that have the best view of the wings, where you can take the most beautiful flight photos. But the triangles aren't there for this reason, of course. The crew members monitor the condition of the aircraft through windows under these signs. In case the wings freeze, the engine catches fire, or the pilot receives a signal something's wrong, the crew will quickly move to the triangles and assess the situation. Those mysterious chimes you hear during the flight are a kind of secret language the crew uses to communicate with each other. The chime you hear shortly after takeoff informs the crew that the landing gear is getting retracted. 
A single chime during the flight is a sign that one of the passengers needs the assistance of the crew. When they're serving meals and run out of food or drinks, they can ask their colleagues to share using a high and low chime combo. Three low tones mean serious turbulence is approaching, so the crew needs to buckle up. A seatbelt on an airplane has a slightly different purpose from that in your car. The one in the vehicle protects you from a horizontal hit. When a plane is going through turbulence, it's shaking up and down. Your waist belt keeps you from hitting the ceiling. The tray table, the seatbelt buckle, and the toilet door handle. Those are some major feeding grounds for bacteria. But the seat pockets aren't any cleaner. Passengers leave their used tissues or wipes in there after cleaning a runny nose or coughing. They also become a residence for other sorts of trash. Even once the trash is out, the bacteria remain in their cozy pocket home. The next passenger becomes their new prospective target. Blech. Extreme heat is one of the weather conditions that can stop a plane from flying. Airplanes fly by generating lift with their wings. The air below the wings takes the plane up. In extreme heat, the airplane can't produce that much lift. That's because hot air expands and becomes way less dense than cold air. With less lift, the plane may find it really hard to take off and fly. Electronics will unlikely respond well to extreme heat or humidity, and the AC system may fail. Smaller jets can't operate at a temperature of over 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Larger Airbus and Boeing planes perform the best below 126 degrees Fahrenheit. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. You get on any airliner and notice the captain always sits in the left seat and the co-pilot on the right. And that's not by accident. The reasons could be historical. One theory goes that the first air forces were recruited from cavalry officers. They used to wear swords on their left side, so it was more comfortable for them to mount horses from the animal's left. When we eventually went from horses to metal birds, the tradition stuck. Another theory involves trains. The first international air route connected London and Paris. During this flight, pilots navigated by following the railroad. History has it that once, when the weather was especially bad, two planes collided because both were flying over the tracks. After that, it was agreed that the aircraft would fly on the right side of the track. Pilots had to sit on the left side of the plane to see how much clearance they had with oncoming aircraft on their left. As for helicopter pilots in command, they usually, but not always, sit on the right. Copters are more unstable than airplanes. That's why pilots prefer not to let go of the cyclic stick. This stick controls the helicopter's direction and altitude. The cyclic stick sits between the pilot's knees, and they use their right hand to hold onto it. The pilot's left hand moves the lever that changes the blade's pitch and presses other buttons on the central console. By the way, both seats have full control of an airplane. There are no regulations specifying which seat the captain and co-pilot should occupy. The co-pilot is just as experienced and capable of flying a plane as the captain. The captain often flies the plane to its destination, and the co-pilot operates it on the way back. Pilots are tested every 6-8 to eight months. They use flight simulators and practice all kinds of emergencies. After that, examiners assess them. Safety and technical tests and medical examination also take place regularly. An extra seat in the cockpit behind the pilots is for inspectors who monitor the flight. This seat is also called a jump seat because when you get up from it, it folds up right away. Yep, a lot like movie theater seats. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin if possible. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't get shaken that much. Imagine the plane like a big teeter-totter. Similar principle when it comes to turbulence. Choosing a window seat, you get an opportunity to see how the airplane wings flex and flap. They're designed to move this way. If the wings were stiff, they would snap off once turbulence hit the plane. Well, that's comforting. In most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. Woohoo! If the turbulence is strong enough for pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white-knuckled turbulence is super rare, but it can make the plane drop 100 feet.